Well, I'm the episode of Jay Leno's Garage Restoration Blog. We'll show you, well, because of the pandemic, we've slowed down quite a bit. We got some stuff done. And I just thought I would fire this up for old time's sake. People seem to like to see these steam engines run. I've lit the boiler already out back. What I'm doing now is priming it with a little oil. Just, I'm forcing oil into the line here. That should be enough. Uh, we've built up some pressure. Let's see what I got. You open this tap to get any water out of the cylinders because water does not compress. You could blow this whole thing. It'd be a shame because this, this engine is exactly as it was in 1866. Lincoln was president when this engine was built. It's all original, all the original bolts, original lagging. Let's see if I've got anything here. I'm gonna try and move this. <coughs> this wheel has three tons. Have I got anything? Here we go. Okay, here we go. Well, so much of the myth of steam engines being noisy, you see how quiet it is. All you're hearing is really the wheel going around. And once it gets hot, this bit of noise will quiet down as well. Okay, I can shut this now. This is your governor. I've told this story before, but for people who knew, uh, that's where the expression balls out comes from. Those balls, centrifugal force forces them out. That controls the cam, which slows down so the engine doesn't over rev and eat itself up. This thing was 125 horsepower in 1860. This is what the Luddites were afraid of. They go in and they smash these engines up because they took work away from craftsmen. This produced 125 horsepower, which was unbelievable back in the day. And this was just seen as a job stealer. You know, how many men could do the work of this, would it take to do the work of this engine? 10, I don't know, but that was a problem. It's a precision piece of machinery. It's all one casting. This thing weighs about 12, 14 tons, I don't know, something like that. This was shipped across the country by horse and wagon. The only thing that comes apart is this wheel. The wheel is in two pieces, that's it. So it's, it's a pretty amazing piece of equipment. Thomas Edison used one just like this, a Wright engine, uh, to light up Trenton, New Jersey in 1876 for the, uh, for the World's Fair exhibition. It was the first time an outside area had been lit and people just went crazy. It literally made nighttime daytime. But the amazing thing is how quiet it is. This engine over here, this is 1832. I believe this is the oldest steam engine in America still running on steam. I could be wrong, I'm not sure. But it's what they call a walking beam. These are your, uh, that's your governor right there, your balls out governor. This is your hand throttle here. There was no OSHA, so you walk over, oh, hey, what's this? Ah, ah, and then get another worker because they were cheap. But this is what people did before Netflix. They'd come out and, oh, just watch the steam engine for a couple of hours. Pretty much it. Anyway, I just thought you'd get a kick out of seeing both of these operate. There's so much detail in these, and they're beautifully made, and they run forever. See, it ran till 1928, from 1866 to 1928, and then it sat for 50-something years, maybe 60 years. And then I got it, and all I did was put it together, build a fire, and go. Try that with a modern engine. It took seven tons of cement to get this level. But once it's level, it'll run forever, so the engine doesn't eat itself up. All right, if this car looks familiar, it's because you may have seen it eight or 10 years ago when we first started, 1962 Maserati 3500 GTI, great car. We got it all done, and then I was driving it, and in the first 500 miles, the transmission was nothing but trouble. 
it popping out of second gear, grinding. To get it in reverse, you had to stop, turn the car off, back it up. It was nothing but a pain. I just got discouraged and we parked it. Then the pandemic came along and I said, I love this thing, so we need to do something about it. So what we did was we put a, a Tremec TKX box in. This is a fabulous gearbox, a five-speed gearbox, way stronger, way tougher, can take a lot more power than the, uh, than the ZF that was in here. Uh, I'd be curious to hear some of your comments. You know, have I ruined a car? By, well, I can go back at any point and put a ZF box in it. I still have it. And if I ever sold a car, that will go with it. Uh, Bernard made a, a, a bell housing. There was, there was nothing available. So, well, here, here's a raw chunk of aluminum. Here he is making the bell housing. And it bolted right up. Uh, obviously, we had to change the drive shaft. Uh, these TKXs are great because you, where you put the shifter is adjustable, so it'll fit just about everywhere. But now it shifts, oh, it really makes it enjoyable. Now, a lot of people say, hey, maybe you ruined this car, but you know, we put air conditioning in it, which it didn't have. Uh, we did a few other things to it. It's still a Maserati uh, with twin cam with uh, two plugs per cylinder. It just dries better and handles better, still has the stock brakes. Uh, you can turn it back to what it was at any point, but now it really shifts and really drives wonderfully. We also put a, uh, a new head gasket in it. That had a leak. You know, I'm sure you've all been there. You get these problems where you start working on something and it gets so discouraging. You just park it. And that's what we did with, with this one. But I got two gearboxes from Tremec to put in. This one in the, this one in the Maserati and the other one in the Firebird. And it, Really, if you're looking for a gearbox, this is not an ad, it really is about the best you can get. It's just bulletproof, it bolts right up, it's easily adaptable. And the nice thing is we can take the transmission out without touching the engine, either from down below or above. There was a crossbar here, but it's not structural. Uh, so we, took, we just eliminated it and this works perfectly well. Uh, it looks like it's hanging, but it's not. It's bolted up at the engine. It's in here very securely. Uh, new drive shaft. Uh, what else we got? That, that's about it. I mean, if you want to see the full restoration of this car, you can see a younger looking me eight or 10 years ago uh, talking about it and driving it. And I did drive it for a while, enjoyed it. It's just that the gearbox became such a pain. I just parked it and younger, prettier projects came along and we worked on them and then I went back to Old Faithful after this. Now it shifts and drives nice. Now it can really put a lot of miles on it. As you can see, the passenger seat is not in and we still gotta put the, uh, the cover over the transmission, but it goes back perfectly fine and at least now it's a running, driving car you can really use and I can go back to stock whenever I want. The nice thing about doing something like this is Nobody can tell. You open the hood, it's still all Maserati. You'd have to actually get under the car and go, hey, wait a minute, you know, and to realize that it's not stock. But why go to back to stock when I got a better, stronger transmission? So come on, let's move on to the next project. Well, here's a bike I've had for well over 30 years. Uh, this is a Vincent Black Shadow. Uh, the thing that makes this rare is it is the very first Vincent Black Shadow. It's the third one built, the first one sold. What happened was, I was riding my other Black Shadow, and my first year doing The Tonight Show, uh, I was out on uh, Mulholland Highway, and a guy in a BSA just slammed me, just T-boned me, knocked me down, dented the tank, and I said on TV, I need a gas tank for Vincent Black Shadow. Everybody's got one, let me know. So this old guy calls me, and uh, he said, I, I got a tab, but I got a whole bike, got to buy the whole bike. I said, what do you got? He goes, 47 Vincent Black Shadow. I said, they really didn't build any in 47. He said, no, no, mine's the first one. I was the first one, the guy, it was the third one built. I, I always wanted one. I was in Europe, I was a GI, and I went to the factory and picked it up. I went, well, okay. Uh, can you give me the engine numbers on the bike? Okay. So they gave me the engine number, frame number. I called the Vincent Club and I said, uh, could you run these numbers for me? The guy comes back, oh yeah, that's the uh, bike was destroyed, it's been lost. I said, that's what I thought. What was the story? He said, oh, this young GI bought it from America and they said the guy's name. And I went, uh, that's the guy that called me. 
And what happened was, in 47, he got it home in 48. This has a bronze idler gear, and that broke. So he just put it in his garage, and it sat there for 60 years. Well, not quite, 50 years. And that's when I bought it from him. And uh, here it is. See, you can tell these early ones, these have the coffee can speedometer. See, the story of the Black Shadow, what this is, it was uh, Phil, Philip Vincent liked the, the Rapide, which is the one that had aluminum colored fenders, silver uh, fenders, uh, cylinders rather, aluminum cylinders. And uh, Phil Irving, the brilliant engineer, he designed the Black Shadow in secret because Phil Irving said, no, the Rapide's fine, it's fast enough, we're selling all we can, that's good enough. Well. Okay, so Irving built this one in secret. They use, I'm told, a speedometer from a Jaguar. They put in what they call this coffee can type holder here. And uh, the rest is history. They built six like this. This is the third one built and the very first one sold when my guy got it. So all we did was sort of clean it up a little bit, make sure she's running nicely. Notice it doesn't have the hydraulic forks. It has the Bramptons on it. Uh, very early bike, wonderful to ride. A lot of people prefer these forks to the hydraulics. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, it's, it's a Vincent term. It was the only bike that had them, so. Anyway, I thought you'd get a kick out of seeing that. To me, it's still probably, next to the Bruff Superior, one of the most beautiful motorcycles ever made. Come on, I'll show you the Dodge Polara. This is a car that's uh, always fascinated me. This is a 1964 Dodge Polara 426 Max Wedge. We all know the 426 Hemi. A lot of people don't realize before the 426 Hemi, there was the 426 Max Wedge, which was a 383. There was bored out and a few other things were done to it to make it 426. Uh, it usually had two carburetors on it on the, on the stage three, the high performance one, I believe. This one has a single carburetor, often has a manifold. The original four-speed transmission. This is all original paint except for the roof. Somebody along the way had painted the roof silver. Uh, we went back to the original red. We matched it pretty good. When you see this on the restoration blog in a couple of weeks, it'll be all buffed out. Somebody also added these reflectors in here. Uh, I took off the mag wheels and it was all jacked up, but I just put, uh, we put Willwood disc brakes. You know, Willwood, again, they make brakes for almost any American car. And when you have something like this, it has this much horsepower, close to 400 and it's really fast. Having that single mass assembly with brake drums, even though the Max Wedge, the brake drums were an inch wider because they knew it was powerful, so they wanted it to stop. So you could get metallic lining, and it actually stopped pretty good, but not as good as a brand new set of disc brakes. And once again, you can go back if you want, but I like to drive my stuff. Uh, the interior, I believe, is all original. This is all original paint, original chrome. Nothing's been re-chromed. Uh, no power steering, no power brake. This is what they used to call a man's car. It's just kind of funny. You know, it's a man's machine, they would say that stuff. But you know, everybody credits the GTO as the first supercar, or the first muscle car. Uh, and even though this is a little bigger body than the GTO, it's not that much bigger. And with this 426 and the four speed, these were really powerful cars. Chrysler was at the top of their game back in the early 60s, mid 60s. Come on, let's show you the engine in this thing. This is the 426 Max Wedge, uh, Offenhauser uh, manifold with Edelbrock carburetor. These are the factory headers. These are really kind of cool. Uh, there's a new Willwood master cylinder dual circuit, of course. We moved the Willwood up a little bit. The original is much lower here, so it ran the risk of boiling the fluid, which was very, a very real thing back in the day. So with this Willwood master and having it up higher, Runs much cooler. Of course, we put a yellow top Optiman here. It's got the ability to crank this thing all day long, so that's nice. But it does start right up because MSD ignition. Not a lot in here that's stock, but enough. These are just tasteful upgrades that you would have done back in the day. Uh, the disc brake is really the thing that makes a difference because you got something like this, and you got to slam on the brakes. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it's a little tricky. I think I'm like the third owner of this car. Um, we started to rub it out a little bit here using some of our own uh, Jay Leno's Garage products. And the paint is coming back nicely. The only part we painted was the roof. Come on, let's move on to the Revere. That was the other project down the road here. This is the Revere with the Rochester Duesenberg. This was a racing engine back in the day called the Walking Beam. Slowly getting this together. As you can see, we've just made, fabricated a whole custom exhaust system. We got that in. 
And this is real close to being ready to fire. I know I say that every time, but other projects come along. Uh, a lot of the switch gear was um, pot metal and it disintegrated, so we had to scan it and make new ones out of brass. Uh, so that takes a little while. But you look in here and you'll see the exhaust system and transmission. It's very close to being done. And we finally finished that, uh, that uh, fire truck engine. Remember when the rod came through the side? Come on, I'll show you the repair. Now here's something you might remember. In season, I think, two, maybe three of the show, we had the Christie fire engine we got from Burbank, uh, the 1913. And uh, we got it running for him, and we shot it, and we are going up the hill, and boom, the end just blew apart. A rod like this, this is, the, this is the rod, came through the side of the block and blew a hole in it. Well, we sent it out to lock and stitch. They fixed the block. It looks brand new. We had Carrillo make us some custom rods. You know, Carrillo rods, the racing rods for this thing. Had special pistons made. Um, you know, Burbank was nice enough to lend it to us. So I said, I'll fix the engine for you. Well, $60,000 later, it's, <laughs> it's done. But it's, it's beautiful, and it's going to run just fabulous. Uh, we're going to put it back in in the next couple of weeks. We got it all together. You cannot see where the, where the, here, can I turn this? Let me see. You cannot see where it came through the block. I'm gonna show it to you. I'll show you the, the hole. It was right here, I believe. Yeah, right through there. Look at that, you can't even tell. It's amazing, you know, you have an engine block with a hole in it. You think, ah, oh, this engine, it's a matching number engine. I had a Bugatti where it came through the side of the block. Lock and Stitch fixed, fixed, uh, fixed that one too. Uh, so you can keep your original engine and be honest and tell people what happened. It was repaired and it has the original numbers on it. This is a 20 liter four cylinder engine. Each piston is five liters. Each piston is <laughs> basically like a 289 engine out of a Mustang. Just enormous things. And it's a, they're beautiful motors. It's what they call a T-head. You see you have valves on both sides of the, uh, of, the, of the pistons in the center. You've got your intake here and your exhaust. That's your intake here and your exhaust on this side. And that's how that works. So we should be able to fire that up for you the next time we do this. So come on, I'll show you our final project. Well, this car is finally finished. You probably saw this in previous restoration blogs. You'll see us driving it and do a whole in-depth thing in a couple of weeks on this one. This will be coming up very soon. Final thing was the interior. The only thing not stock, I did the interior in leather. I just like leather, it's just so much more comfortable. And, and French cars are just wonderful driving cars, so having that comfortable leather seat. Uh, but this car has a lot of unique features. Look at the brake drums are external, so they stay cool. Can you see how the wheel goes around them there? It's kind of neat, but we'll get into all of that when we do uh, the whole shoot on this car. So anyway, I hope you like some of this restoration blog and uh, thanks for all your comments. We appreciate it. And uh, the pandemic is slowing down. I got the crew back for this shoot, so that's good. Uh, we're still under some restrictions, but it's getting better and I hope you guys are staying safe too. So thanks everybody. See you next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>